right? Okay. Okay, there we go. Wheel set. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You tell me if, uh... Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to begin. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome all of you here to the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. Uh, and uh, this very special place, the uh, Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. Uh, I always like to ask, it's just, uh, I'm always curious if there are those in the audience who are visiting the campus for the very first time. If you put your hands up, I, well, there you are. Uh, later I'll tell you, uh, there's a special blessing to recite for all of you, and so I'm very welcome. We, uh, we uh, extend a special welcome to all of you who are here for the first time and uh, hope it will be the first of many times. So tonight, friends, we have a, a remarkable and uh, unique experience. Uh, only the American Jewish Archives can gather together the kind of brain power that we've, we've assembled in American Jewish history. Uh, I think it, it would be uh, worthwhile uh, beginning this evening talking a little bit about why we've had this program, why we've organized the program. Uh, a, a rabbi by the name of uh, Chai Ben Sharira, who uh, is known to those who study the rabbinic world as the Chai Gaon. He was, in the 10th century, uh, the leading figure, the head of the academy in Pumpadita, a uh, great uh, center of Jewish learning. And uh, one saying that is attributed to him is, that there are three possessions that one should prize and value above all others. And these are they. Your field, obviously, you need that to sustain yourself. Uh, your friends, or a friend, because you definitely cannot get through life easily without people who care about you. And the third is a book. And uh, this is what's brought us together. We've given birth, if you will, to a new book that uh, has special interest to this particular place and uh, to uh, the raison d'etre of the American Jewish Archives. And uh, this uh, book, as you'll hear, uh, sort of began and was the brainchild of uh, Professor Jeff Gurak, who is going to be introduced in just a moment. I want to also point out, this worked out incidentally and accidentally, that, uh, but appropriately so, because as I hope all of you know, the American Jewish Archives is a great collection on American Jewish, on the American Jewish experience, but does not only contain material relative to our reform movement. In fact, it is a collection of material relating to the entirety of the American Jewish experience and how nice it is that we're uh, so ecumenical tonight. We have Professor Gurak, who in a minute I'll introduce. Professor Gurak is the professor of American Jewish history at Yeshiva University in New York. And then in a minute I'm going to introduce uh, professor Shuley Rubin Schwartz, who is Dean and Professor of American Jewish History at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And of course, uh, we welcome back uh, uh, Ben Bayat, a, a person who is part of our community for so many years and uh, currently uh, the uh, Professor of American Jewish History at uh, Brandeis University, uh, Jonathan Sarna. So uh, we are, the four of us really, I, I, I think it's fair to say, we cover the field. So uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, now give you just a, 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 a brief introduction to each of the speakers. 
And uh, then um, I'm going to call on Professor Gurak to launch us. Uh, our, our plan this evening, as you can see, is to be informal. We're going to have conversation. And uh, uh, if you're so moved, you could join in to the conversation. But uh, we're going to start first among ourselves. So let me, let me first of all begin with uh, Professor Jonathan D. Sarna, who is the university professor and the Joseph H. and Bell R. Brown Professor of American Jewish History at Brandeis University. Up until this year, has also been the chair of the Hornstein uh, Jewish Professional Leadership Program at Brandeis. And now, have you already begun? Uh, August the 1st. August the 1st, he's going to head up. I've the, begun, but officially. Yes, uh, yes. And the Schusterman <laughs> Center for Israel for, Studies. Center for Israel oh, Studies. So, I succeed David Ellenson. That's, that's correct. what's really You're, important here. That is correct. That well, is correct. And uh, and of course, we we for, from from the beginning of my tenure, uh, Dr. Sarna. First of all, uh, uh, Professor Sarna is uh, the author of numerous volumes and uh, and uh, countless articles on American Jewish history. Uh, his a great work, American Judaism, is pretty much the textbook uh, in courses on American Jewish history all over the country. So uh, join me now in welcoming back Professor Jonathan Sarr. I guess, I guess I'll start now, because if I forget this, I'm sure that uh, later in the evening I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have it forgotten. But this is a special evening because tomorrow, Professor Sarna and uh, uh, Dr. Shuley Rubin Schwartz will return to New York, where Professor Sarna is going to be recognized with an honorary degree from JTS. And I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Shuley Rubin Schwartz is the Irving Lehrman Research Associate Professor of American Jewish History and the Walter and Sarah Schlesinger Dean of Graduate and Undergraduate Studies at the JTS. And uh, she, too, is the author of numerous publications. God bless you. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, yet uh, her, her, her uh, leading work is uh, work on the Rebetzin, the, uh, which was published in 2006, was the winner of the uh, Jewish Book Council Award in that year. And uh, uh, Shuli, uh, we welcome you back to Cincinnati. Let's give her a big round. And now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you the uh, gentleman who actually uh, was the spark plug for this volume and uh, edited it and organized it and made it into a reality. Professor Jeffrey S. Gurak, who is the Libby M. Clapperman Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University. Professor Gurak is the author of a, a whole range of important publications, a volume on Mordecai Kaplan, uh, also uh, a volume on Orthodox Jewry in America, uh, Jews in New York, and uh, those of you who uh, uh, have uh, been following his career for some time know that one of his uh, most best-known publications is the History of Jewish Harlem in New York. So uh, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, of uh, history power here this evening. So without any further ado, I am going to call on. Uh, Professor Gurak to launch our evening. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. You can applaud. <laughs> you know, it's really a pleasure to be back in Cincinnati, and uh, we'll talk a lot about our careers throughout this evening, but I want to start by saying that this college institute launched me in many ways on my career because in 1974, the late uh, Professor Sam Sandmill offered me a fellowship to come to Cincinnati. I had just passed my orals. I was unemployed. And uh, my professor, Tzvi Ankori, who was a Byzantine scholar mentoring people in American Jewish history, which we'll talk about later on, 
called Sam and said, I have this fellow who wants to come and sit in the archive. And I think I was the template for what became later on this wonderful fellowship program, which so many of my colleagues have been part of. And along those lines, I also remember Fanny Zelka, who was the archivist back in the day, and Moira Steiner, who ran the American Jewish Periodical Center. All these people yeah. were instrumental in what I ended up uh, doing. Why did I turn to this book? Uh, I see myself both as a student of American Jewish history and as an advocate for the field. I became aware that over the last few years, a number of volumes have appeared about how people who got involved in writing women's history and ethnic history wrote memoirs about how they entered the field, some of the challenges they faced, and how they ultimately succeeded in growing a field. And I wanted us as American Jewish historians to be on the record to tell our story. And I think we have an intriguing story, and you'll hear pieces of it uh, tonight. And this book is for scholars. I also think it's for general readers alike, notwithstanding its high cost of the volume, but it makes a, a wonderful uh, uh, Father's Day gift, I suppose. <laughs> it's, it was a it's been a long road to acceptance of our field within the humanities to offer just one indication of how far we, we have come. As late as the mid-1960s, a professor of American history at Brandeis University, in evaluating what American Jewish history was all about, said that those who do American Jewish histories are antiquarians, gentlemen or ladies of respectable origins who are utterly alienated from the present. They are collectors of dead facts, which they stuff fill of sawdust and separately enclose in glass cases. Right now, there's a gentleman working on an article called A Jewish Tourist at the Battle of Bladensburg. Bladensburg was in the War of 1812. I had to Google that to find out what that was all about. <laughs> this same professor, three years ago, served as a reader of a student of mine and Jonathan's at Brandeis University, a young scholar who's making his mark, who is also a fellow uh, of the Marcus Center. So we've come a long way. That's one indication. But actually, this book is about a second or third generation in terms of the evolution of our field. We stand on the shoulders of those who preceded us, who began this field, legitimizing it within the academy with great, with great difficulties. You know, until the 1950s, most of the work in American Jewish history was, was ancestor worship and Jewish defense through use of history, as if to say, if your ancestors said that they came to America at Plymouth Rock, that's okay, because there was Jew waiting for them at Plymouth Rock to welcome them to America, which of course is not true, but that was the nature of the field. After 1954, a small group of heroes and one heroine our esteemed predecessors began the struggle to professionalize the field. So much can be said about Dr. Marcus. I'll just say one personal note. When I was at HUC, and then later giving a talk at the Central Conference of American Rabbis at Grossinger's of Blessed Memory, <laughs> Marcus was in the audience, and he was taking notes. He was taking notes. I'm a callow kid talking about my work and he's taking notes. When I think of Marcus, that comes to mind more than anything else. And then, of course, there was Sailor Barone, the most influential Jewish historian of the 20th century, who was a teacher of our teacher, Naomi W. Cohen, who just passed away a few months ago. And Marcus and Barone, you might know, during World War II, talked about the transfer of leadership from Europe during the Shoah to America. They gave similar talks in two different cities, but the need for American Jews to understand their history and to write it professionally. A few other names that come to mind who are in the introduction. Moshe Davis at the Jewish Theological Seminary and who brought the study of American Jewish history to the University World of Israel, also one of the important pioneers. And since I come from Yeshiva, let me mention Hyman Grinstein, who was one of Barone's first students, who did a book called The Rise of the Jewish Community in New York. It's as much archaeology as it was history. Uh, we say yesh mi ayin, something from nothing, digging up the sources that make this field very, very important. HUC, JTS, Yeshiva were the first places where American Jewish history 
was studied and taught, and part of it was the idea that we're training rabbis and scholars and students to take leadership roles in the community, and they must know their history. But rarely was American Jewish history taught at, in, American in American universities. The prime example is our teacher, Naomi W. Cohen, who taught for many years American political history and American diplomatic history at Hunter College. Only when she was towards the end of her career was she able to introduce a course in American Jewish history at her university. And in 1973, she introduced the first course in American Jewish history at Columbia University. And I was fortunate enough to be her student at that point. So one of the things I wanted to do in this book is to tell people how far we've come, to some extent pay tribute to our predecessors, but also talk about the road that we've traveled as scholars and as teachers. And I also wanted to answer a question that always comes up when I give a lecture. Frankly, I don't necessarily, I don't really look the part of an academic. I look more like an athletic director than I do a <laughs> department chair. So often they ask me, how did you end up in this field? And my answer is part of the, the book that you'll hear about today. And one preliminary, final preliminary remark. The 15 men and women who participated in this project are not the only ones in our field. They are representative of many others who are doing good work. They were chosen because of the accessible prose they write, their diverse fields of interest, and their different points of entry into the field of American Jewish history. And we are a porous field. We've invited in people who do work in American studies, in women's history, anthropology, and the like. And I have to say that I'm not a psychologist. I'm hardly a historian, but I do want to say that American Jewish historians are different in some respects from people in other fields. There's less professional jealousy among our cohort. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that we've all had to overcome an outlier status so we have a certain degree of, of community, which I'll talk about later. My final remark. The first academic to be interested in American Jewish history was Cyrus Adler. <laughs> In 1908, as president of the American Jewish Historical Society, um, he prophesied and hoped that someday there would be a course, a series of lectures, and maybe even a chair in American Jewish history. That's 1908. And I feel that through this book you'll see that somewhere Cyrus Adler is smiling. We have fulfilled his dream, even if challenges remain for our field. One of our senior colleagues in Jewish history once referred to what we do as social historians in American Jewish history. What do we study? We study breweries in Brooklyn. That's what he said about our field. But I want you to know, and I say this all the time, that how Jews eat, how Jews drink, how Jews dress, how they play ball is an essential part of being an American and a Jew and worthy of a consideration. So that's part of my introduction, and that's why I, I turned to my colleagues to do this book, to put us back on the record in terms of how far we've come, and I guess also to say to our junior colleagues who are entering this field that there's work still to be done and challenges still to be met. So thank you for inviting me, and uh, let's move on. That's great. That's a great... So uh, what I propose to do now is I'm going to ask some questions and we're going to have uh, some uh, exchange from the scholars. Uh, I want to begin by uh, asking uh, 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 Professor Gurak and uh, Professor uh, Ruben Schwartz and Professor Sarna to talk uh, about something that they learned about themselves as they sat down to compose this essay. I'll begin the process just by quickly saying that when I was receiving, when I received the call to write and contribute to the book, of course I was flattered and also delighted because uh, Professor Gurak stressed, don't include a lot of footnotes. This is not that kind of a book and it's about your own story. So I thought this would be very easy because who can talk more about Zola than Zola? So uh, that's going to be a simple thing, but it, it proved to be very difficult for me and uh, suddenly it became a, a, a challenging endeavor to try to really delve deeply into why 
I ended up where I ended up. And I, I just want to begin by just saying what I discovered about myself, and then I'm going to hand it over to you, and that is that uh, it may not have been explicit in what uh, Professor Gurak said, but Dr. Marcus instituted the first required course in a curriculum here in Cincinnati at the Hebrew <coughs> Union College when it became, in the 1940s, impossible to be ordained from HUC in Cincinnati without having taken a course in American Jewish history. And I believe that my own sensibilities and interests were shaped by many rabbis who obviously had come through Cincinnati and had taken this course and were teaching this material out in the field. And my essay, in a sense, what I learned about myself is this interesting interaction in the field of history and also the world of scholarship, particularly American Jewish history, that interested me at a very early age, even when I was in the synagogue, because those who graduate from HUC become interpreters of the studies that they learn here in uh, school, whether it's Bible or Talmud or, in this case, American Jewish history. I'm going to stop because I, we want our out-of-town guests to have more time than myself, but uh, what did you learn about yourself uh, uh, as you began to sit down and write this particular essay? Jonathan, okay. you go first. All right. Well, first of all, let me say what a pleasure to be back here uh, in Cincinnati to see so many uh, friends. Uh, one of, uh, I think it was Isaac Mayer Weiser's son-in-law, Bloch, when he moved from Cincinnati to Chicago, he said, if I forget thee, O Cincinnati, <laughs> let my right hand wither. So I raised both my hands. My hand hasn't withered. I remember uh, Cincinnati and am grateful. Uh, uh, for the many friends and, and really the wonderful and formative 11 years that I spent here. Uh, now, um, what it was interesting to me thinking about the essay and then looking at the volume as a whole, and I should say that uh, Professor Gurak actually also noted it in his introduction, I actually became interested in American Jewish history in high school. Uh, most of the, I think all of the other authors talk about how they came to it in college or later or in graduate school, but somehow or other, uh, I came to it in high school in uh, Brookline uh, because seniors waste a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of their time in high school. They assigned us uh, to write a project if we wanted. And I wrote a paper uh, on the history of anti-Semitism in America. That's, of course, a perennial uh, subject. It was the first time I had done that kind of, of research. Um, and um, I realized, uh, A, that I very much enjoyed doing it, and B, that this was a wide open field uh, back in the early 1970s, uh, there was no synthetic history of American anti-Semitism, and uh, it was clear uh, that this excited me. Um, as you can tell, I wasn't excited by sports, so uh, <laughs> I couldn't go that direction. Uh, and then um, the same year, I got interested. I, Of course, seniors learn how to drive and Massachusetts and the town fathers in Massachusetts had decreed that driver's ed must be a serious subject. And they defined a serious subject, meaning you had to write a paper that had something to do with the automobile or its history. Well, we were a rebellious lad and I had just done this work on anti-Semitism, so I wrote a paper on the anti-Semitism of Henry Ford. <laughs> um, and I have to say, and those of you, of course, know he was a notorious anti-Semite. He was able 
to read the primary source. He wrote, you know, Jew, the world's foremost problem. Uh, and I wrote a, a, a paper on the subject for driver's education. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher told me it was the best research paper he had ever received in driver's education. There was only one slight flaw uh, which I pass on to you. It turns out that knowledge of Henry Ford's anti-Semitism helps you not at all in the driving test, which uh, I proceeded to fail. Uh, I, uh, eventually I passed, uh, but I did these two papers. I um, I enjoyed them very much, much more than I enjoyed the road test. And um, uh, you know, and then I went to Brandeis, and in those days, uh, the American Jewish Historical Society was on the Brandeis campus, and uh, there was professor of American Jewish history there, Leon Jick, and um, I signed up for his course in my freshman year. He had a very, very long syllabus. I didn't know much about college. I figured. Long syllabus, you got to read everything. Later, he told me not every student read everything, but I did. It was great. It was a fabulous introduction uh, to the field. And really, um, uh, from that time, uh, I, uh, I've been in it. And, and one of the interesting things to me was realizing uh, that I must be one of the first people who got <coughs> interested in this almost non-existent field. Well, you were identified, you were identified yeah, in the book as the person who came to the field first, and you said it was part of your family business. You happen to have a parent who is a renowned scholar. I, I also want to ask you, the, this, the American historian that I mentioned, I don't mention his name, was, was he aware of the fact that Jick was on campus at that point? Because it, it just, I'm not, it, I, I no, became I'm, very, I'm, very friendly. You mentioned him, he's one of the greatest historians of the 20th century, uh, uh, Professor David Hackett Fisher, very, a good friend of mine, and, and later uh, we, we actually oversaw a variety of undergraduate and so on theses very early uh, in his career. Um, and he wrote this book, Historian's Fallacies, where uh, this passage comes from. Um, I, I think that over time uh, he somewhat uh, grew up and uh, well, changed. I think, and, I, think, I think we've raised and, his consciousness to take it. Yeah, and I think he became aware. And uh, I would say um, that I personally was deeply influenced by Fisher's uh, style and uh, uh, by his work as an historian. And uh, I think he became aware, as you imply, that, that American Jewish history could be as serious as any other history. Uh, uh, and if uh, you read his memoir, uh, which is found in the Feshrift for Yehuda Reinhardt's, uh, he makes some nice comments about his American Jewish history colleagues. So, right. you know, you live and learn. Live and Shuley, learn. yes. Shuley's um, been too quiet, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, I also, I just want to thank you for inviting us. I want to thank you for this volume. I learned so much about my colleagues, which was such fun. These are colleagues that we've all known for 30, close to 40 years, uh, um, sometimes more. And uh, you think you know your colleagues well, but there's a whole lot that we, I, you really don't know. Uh, in um, this kind of volume where it was a much more personal tone in uh, thinking about uh, who we are and how we came to be. Um, I also, while I, while I would not say that uh, we, I would take an oath for Cincinnati, as someone who uh, has spent my life in New York, where you might know that New Yorkers are just a little bit Censored on themselves, uh, and uh, did, so did you mean superior? if I would say, I leave that for you. You use that word, not me. But when I would uh, tell, when colleagues would say, "So what are you doing this summer?" and I would say, "I'm going to Cincinnati," and they would look at me like, "Well, why would you spend your summer in Cincinnati?" and to try to describe to them that for an American Jewish historian, 
This is like Mecca to us. And um, it's a real privilege to be here um, in this place to talk about the book. So thank you. And spent many wonderful uh, summers here doing research with the hospitality of many of you here. So thank you. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed the opportunity to write this piece. It took me back in a, in a much more personal way, uh, made me feel very grateful for my upbringing uh, and the kind of education that I had, the family history that I have, and um, that really set me on the path to Jewish learning and Jewish studies, although it took me a while to settle on American Jewish history. Um, it was in, I did not think about this in high school at all. I had traditional yeshiva education. It never actually occurred to me until I have to say pretty late in the game, late in high school, that the same Greeks and Romans we learned about or in the Hanukkah story actually had anything to do with what I was learning in ancient history in, uh, in public high school. Uh, so I entered college thinking I would major in math, and uh, that really just took one semester to disabuse me of that notion. And uh, I ended up taking an American history survey in the spring. Now, I would like to have written that I was really interested in Jewish studies, and then I planfully studied American history so I could combine the two. But I've been a college dean for 25 years, so I can't, I have to come clean. And I certainly took that course because my best friend took the first semester, and it was a, I liked the time slot, and it fit in with my schedule. And of course, I was hooked and majored in American history. Uh, it was at that point, through my studies at Barnard and also at JTS, that I began to think about uh, pursuing a field, uh, the, the study of Jewish history. Um, while Moshe Davis had been at JTS, and I'm very proud that the chair that I hold was the chair, the Lehrman, Irving Lehrman professorship was his chair. Um, there was no one teaching American Jewish history at that time at JTS. And in fact, uh, JTS, as it still is, is very focused on classical Jewish texts, Bible, rabbinics. And so um, while I began my studies thinking that I would focus on American Jewish history, each time I would pass Professor Max Kedushin, a professor of rabbinics who was a neighbor of mine, we would pass each other walking to and from JTS, and he would stop me and say, my father was a peddler, your grandfather was a peddler, that's American Jewish history. <laughs> <laughs> now, come study rabbinics. Um, but I was, I was fortunate to, uh, I had a cousin, Aaron Citrin, Zichron Olivracha, who was a professor of, uh, who got a doctorate in Semitics at NYU. And he had in his possession um, some materials from my great-grandfather, a uh, family history that was based on a, uh, a Yechus brief, a, a family history that my great-grandfather had in his possession. And somehow, he must have seen that spark in me before I saw it in myself. And he gave me all of these materials, and he said, OK, I've worked on this. It's your turn. <laughs> and um, in, uh, in college, I wrote a long paper in which I worked with in two different courses, one in the history of American religion and one in uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic and racial history, in which I took this material, translated it, contextualized it, and really became hooked in the field. And it's to this great-grandfather that I really owe this passion for history. He was, one, he was, I would say, the Eliezer ben Yehuda of his town in Kremenitz in the Ukraine. And the, the memorial book of that town says very clearly that his was the only home in that town where Hebrew was the 
language that was spoken. And that, um, that love of scholarship and of learning came through to me, and, I'm, and I've, uh, I, there are still many more letters that I have yet to translate. I've, I've published some of them. Uh, but that really got me started. It was actually the fall of 1972 that Naomi Cohen studied, uh, came to teach at Columbia. I was in college at the time, and I was, again, it was lucky that that was the moment, that the semester that she taught, because I uh, was able to take that course with her. Um, because you were maybe TAing that course, Steve Bain TAed that course, Jack, it never occurred to me that this was a pioneering moment in the field until I read your introduction, Jeff. I, um, I, I knew so little about the negativity that uh, followed American Jewish history that when I was a graduate student with Sviant Kori, who was uh, studied Byzantine history, I went to him and I said, how come there are no courses in American Jewish history? Not knowing that Jonathan was told, don't do American Jewish history, you were told, right? So inadvertently, I had an advantage. You know, you know your day of I didn't know anything. I said, why don't we have a course in America? So I'm taking credit for that. That on Corey called Naomi Cohen. It's Next thing you know, yours. it's all mine. It's all mine. It all went downhill in my career from that point on. <laughs> that's that's for sure. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's that's great. She so, was um, enormously proud. The late Naomi Cohen. I I had um, uh, lunch with her in Jerusalem a few years ago, and she was so proud that she had trained so many of the people in the field. I, I actually, although I knew her, I was not her student, but uh, Janet Joslett was, you were, uh, you were Jeff Wertheimer, and uh, Deborah Dash Moore, I think, studied with her. And it's really a reminder of uh, what a mentor can do. Uh, to my mind, one of the most interesting features of the essays here is that one person after another talks about a teacher, a mentor who uh, was crucial uh, for their entry, whether it was Jacob Rader Marcus or Tzvi Ankori, by the way, her, his daughter is my colleague now at Brandeis, um, and uh, Naomi Cohen, um, uh, Ismar Shorsh, these luminaries in the field were the mentors that people point to uh, who determine the course of their career. Uh, it's a little humbling mm -hmm. when one realizes how much power uh, those of us who sit in the academy have in directing students, but at the same time, uh, one realizes that uh, these folks, uh, through what they taught, and through their personal models, really are responsible for the fact uh, that that uh, so many of us are here and able to write these chapters. And, and there's one other piece, generationally, and that is, I mentioned a few moments ago that I really feel that among American Jewish historians, although we conflict with one another occasionally, there's much less professional jealousy than elsewhere. Uh, one of the things that comes through in the essay is how many of our generation of colleagues assisted one another and identified by name, this colleague spoke to that colleague and, and gave them ideas that they, they want to work on. And, and this is something that is very special, and I think it comes through uh, uh, in the book. I, I just want to say a, a few words about how I ended up doing history. Uh, one of my role models inadvertently was the, the late Rabbi uh, Judah Magnus. Uh, Judah Magnus is renowned as the great Reform Zionist but you may not know that his original career objective was he wanted to be a baseball pitcher. And then he had, he had a sore arm, and he did the next best thing. He became a rabbi and a leading Zionist uh, and the like. While Jonathan was working in the archives in high school and writing about Henry Ford, my dream was to be a professional athlete, and I, and I never made it, okay? And he came from a distinguished um, uh, scholarly family. Shuley came from a distinguished rabbinic family. I came from working class folk. Uh, my parents, neither of them had college education. Um, and uh, I was the first member of my family to go to college. Went to City College of New York. 
pay $37 a semester to go to, to go to college at that point. And at that point, Jewish history, Jewish history at City College, forget about American Jewish history, was placed in a department called Classical Languages and Hebrew, which was the beginning of Jewish studies in this, this, uh, in this country. And there I was privileged to study with some uh, very fine American historians. And I also was there in the late 60s, early 70s, during the time when City College changed and black students came on campus. There was open admissions. And for the first time as a Jew, remember City College was predominantly Jewish, I felt a sense of marginality that we weren't wanted on campus now as the college began to change. So without going through the long story, I ended up working on the history of black Jewish relations. As I think back, because Gary asked, you know, what, you, what I learned about myself, the origins of my interest in Harlem dates back to being in Harlem at City College and being kept, kept off campus. And on Corey was very helpful, but in a roundabout way. He said, I want to do a book called Jews and Blacks in the Age of Jim Crow, 1896 to 1954. And he turned to me and said, if you're going to do this right, don't study pastors or rabbis or politicians. Study a place where Jews and blacks interact with each other. And he suggested I study four cities, Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, and Boston. Had I listened to his advice, literally, I'd still be working on a dissertation today. <laughs> I looked out on the bluff over Morningside Heights, and there it was. It was Harlem. But I think my interest in writing about blacks and Jews dates back to the fact that I was at City College that changed, and I had to think very seriously about my attitudes towards race, and I think a lot of that informed what I did uh, later on. So that was a, an important uh, starting point for me. And frankly, from the Harlem book, everything I've done over the last 40 years is somehow connected to the Harlem experience, whether it be my emphasis on the fact that the denominational labels that are so robust today didn't exist back then. It was clear in the Harlem experience. And I'm a you know, scholar athlete. I wrote a book about Judaism and sports. It dates back to my study of the shul with a pool phenomenon that took place in Harlem. Uh, and all those things are directly related to that initial experience. So I'm very grateful for the fact that the Black Jewish relations interested me enough to do this book, but ultimately work has been more in Jewish history than in African American history. So that, that's really my story. Well, I want to uh, again uh, remind the audience that as we uh, proceed, we're, we're going to be timely, but uh, if you have questions, remember them because we'll try to give you a chance if you do have some to, uh, to pose them. The next question I want to ask the three of you is, uh, were there any uh, recurring themes that you saw in the book as you read it? Of course, the way it worked is we all submitted our own articles, and then later on, once the book was published, we could read what everyone else wrote. So, for example, uh, I uh, talked about a very pivotal event in my career, uh, which was uh, there was a very young uh, postdoc at the Hebrew Union College when I was in my uh, first year of work here at HUC. Uh, I was in the administration named Jonathan Sarna, and he was uh, brought here by Dr. Marcus wow. to continue his studies. He had just finished his doctorate at Yale. And early on, we may have seen each other on the campus once or twice, but very early on, uh, he sort of dawns on him, uh, I can't remember the exact details, but it dawns on him that I'm the person who wrote an article for Dr. Marcus in a class uh, on, uh, on uh, a man by the name of Max Heller, who was uh, the first graduate of HUC in Cincinnati to be a political Zionist very early on, long before uh, there were a lot of reform rabbis involved in Zionism. And he, it, uh, Dr. Sarnov walks up to me and he says, now that was a great article that you wrote. That, in fact, that article should be published. And that was the first time that anyone had suggested to me that something I had worked on 
uh, was worthwhile for others to read. And not only did he do that, but then he went and helped me to revise it and saw to it that it could be published. The common theme that I saw in the book when I got it, I wrote that, was that almost all of the writers make mention of Dr. Sarna in a similar way. So uh, it's no accident that tomorrow he's being recognized with an honorary doctorate uh, for his contributions to the field. But I'd be interested in the other uh, uh, recurrent themes that maybe you noticed. There was a woman historian who didn't do American Jewish history as her primary field, who was so influential to the women scholars, and it turns out there are more women scholars on that board than, than uh, male scholars, having something to do with three of the men scholars who I invited disappointed me and didn't show up. So that's how that worked out. And I just want to mention her name, and that's Paula Hyman. Mm -hmm. every, every woman historian notes the fact her major field was Western European Jewish history. She wrote this, the first uh, synthetic work on the history of Jewish women in America. Uh, and was very interested in American Jewish history, and as a, as a, I'm talking as a man, but as a, for, for the women in the field, as a role model, uh, the generation after Naomi Cohen, she was so influential and so powerful, her name appears in so many of the essays of the women who were, who were invited to be part of this book. So I think she should be mentioned, too, in terms of, Jonathan mentioned the luminaries. She was one of the luminaries who was a contemporary of ours and sadly is no longer with us. Yes, so. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because uh, in my essay I talk about, uh, as I told you, the, uh, the importance of rabbis in shaping my interest, but also of scholars. What, what I didn't mention because it was so brief, but Paula was my counselor at camp. Uh, so uh, it, it, she was too busy, I think, uh, running in the other direction to teach me anything about American Jewish history, but she too was a part of uh, the shaping of that experience, which was important to me. So I'd like to, I'd like to also mention Paula Hyman, but in a little bit of a different way. She was indeed a mentor to me. She was the second reader of my dissertation. But um, one of the things that uh, I felt very was very important to write about as I reflected on my career is what it was like as a woman um, to go into this career as a woman who uh, had a family, was rearing four children at the time that I was trying to uh, finish my dissertation and uh, establish myself in my career. Um, I, I remember very distinctly when I was probably studying for my orals, in the JTS cafeteria, Paula Hyman was having lunch with Ismar Shorsh, who was my mentor, my primary mentor, and still is. And um, she was so pregnant, she couldn't really reach the, she couldn't reach the table. And that image stayed with me forever, because she was a brilliant scholar, and. A, wonderful mentor, but it gave me hope, you know, it, it, it enabled me to see a picture of a scholar who could also be a mother. And, um, and I, you know, with that in mind, I also want to say that, that, you know, Ismar Shorsh, who was um, so encouraging of me, it took me a long time to finish because I was having children at that stage of life. And I remember having conversations with other colleagues who are, appear in this book who, who don't talk so much about their family life in their, um, in their pieces in the book. But uh, who, you know, I remember in the dorm room here, when we were here in the archives, talking with a colleague who said very clearly to me, I'm not having children until I get tenure. And if it takes that long and I don't have children, that's okay because I want my career comes first. And I was there, I had two children by that point. It was, I just weaned my second child in time to spend a month at the archives. And that was clearly not the choice that I was making. And I really 
wasn't sure whether I would finish. But each time I had a child, Ismar Shorsh would write me a note with his left-handed scrawl yeah. that would say, he sent the formal note, and then at the bottom he wrote, Mazel tov, but keep working. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, initially, I, I, it, it made, it, I, didn't, I didn't know what to make of that comment. And I thought, is he really pushing me to work when I have a newborn? How am I going to do that? But I came to understand and deeply appreciate the fact that he was holding my intellectual life at, <laughs> during those months when I couldn't. And he had the confidence in me that I did not quite have in myself that I was going to get, always get back to it and produce on, in my own timetable. I want to say an additional word about career paths of scholars, how difficult it has been. Um, I want you all to read Deborah Dash Moore's essay. and She talks about taking a high school program in Jewish studies at the seminary and the people who are teaching her later, later on became outstanding tenured faculty members but back then to make a living they were moonlighting teaching high school high school students and you know one of the to be totally candid with you, one of the burdens of our field today is that we have innumerable young people who are doing outstanding work, but the career market is so difficult for them, it almost harkens back to some bad old days that uh, I believe that each one of us uh, was part of a very fortunate, fortunate generation. I know you're a bit more optimistic about the future no, than I am, no, but, but, but I, I, this I is something that uh, has become very problematic in, in the field of humanities and in, and in Jewish studies. And um, uh, when I read Deborah's essay, it reminded me of the contemporary problems that the, the scholars face. Yeah, I, I agree completely, actually. I think one of the valuable things about this book is that um, young people, young students, graduate students who read it will see that many of their esteemed faculty yeah. actually Struggle. didn't have it so easy. Certainly when I graduated Yale in 1979, neither I nor most of my cohort had jobs and Dr. Marcus created a postdoc and uh, he created it because there wasn't another job. Um, uh, uh, Jenna Joselet talks about uh, how difficult it was uh, for her to get a position and really that's why she moved into material culture uh, because there were jobs in museums. Um, I think that some of uh, today's generation imagine ah, for the previous generation it was so easy and now it's so hard. It is very, very hard. Uh, today, and I, I'm not as optimistic as I once was as I see the field and see what's happened in the humanities and, and so on, but uh, I think one of the themes that students will get out of this mm -hmm. is it wasn't so easy. Uh, and uh, I, I think the people who write these chapters realize and I include myself, how fortunate we were uh, that eventually uh, things work out. And in my case, I really credit HUC for that. Um, but it wasn't like, um, uh, you know, uh, people were flying us all over the place when we were finishing our doctorate. Won't you teach here and won't you teach there? That might have been the case. Uh, had we gone into uh, computer science, but uh, it certainly was not the case in American Jewish history. Well, uh, let me ask another question, and then uh, I'm going to throw it open to the audience, see if you want to ask some questions. Uh, I, I wondered if there was something that was you found surprising or that caught you off guard. Uh, uh, in part, I suppose we've touched on some of that, but was there something about your colleagues uh, that you, you, you just never knew, had no idea about, or something about 
what was written that as a collective that made you uh, surprised, uh, surprised you uh, as you read through the book? So one of our contributors is Ellie Letterhandler, who is a professor of American Jewish history at Hebrew University, following literally in the footsteps of Moshe Davis, this, the okay. Center for the Study of Contemporary Jewry. And his field of expertise initially was East European Jewish history. And he writes that he had to go on Aliyat and move, move to Israel to become aware of the importance of American Jewish history. And his job, as he sees it, besides writing uh, some very fine books, he just put out a very fine uh, one-volume history of American Jewry, is that he is now interpreting American Jewish history to Israeli students. And this has raised his consciousness about himself as an ole, as a migrant, as an ole to, to Israel. And this has helped him uh, rethink his own life and the fields that he's uh, gone into. So he's, uh, it's an extraordinary essay, very revealing and very personal about, I had to go in Aliyah to learn about what it means to be an American Jewish historian. So we are an international field. I should also note, although they're not represented here, <coughs> that there are a number of colleagues, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish, of European origin, who've become intrigued in American Jewish history. And perhaps they'll be part of a second volume if my, my uh, publisher is interested. I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I, I was uh, very taken by Mark Bellman's uh, chapter, uh, and it, it, it helped me, it, it kind of sharpened um, what I guess we all know, but it brought it home in a very deep way of the serendipity of life and, and how circumstances work out and where, where you're born, when you're born. And here's a scholar who, uh, because of the draft, spent time serving in Vietnam. It interrupted his career. He came back. He had to go to somewhere else, uh, uh, finish eventually in, in a, at a different institution. And um, it, it, he really highlights what, again, is obvious. If American Jewish history is the stepchild of the larger field of American history and the stepchild of the larger field of Jewish history, well, he specialized in Southern Jewish history. So talk about marginalization upon marginalization upon marginalization and the way in which it impacted his career. And I, I just found it very poignant, partly in light of a lot of the challenges that some of our younger and I'll mention today. Steve Whitfield and Mark yes. Bauman. They influence each other. They encourage each other to, mm -hmm. to grow that field of Southern Jewish mm -hmm. history. Which is, and mm -hmm. Gary, of course, Gary also contributes to that yep. field as well. They, but yeah. they, both of them mention mm -hmm. the uh, cross-fertilization, so yeah. to speak, that uh, took mm -hmm. place. Uh, these were 16 great scholars, 15 plus me. Uh, uh, <laughs> and you, I want you to hear their voices. Gary, I want to read to you one snippet from someone who's not here who is in the volume, and that's Jenna, w, Jenna Weissman Jocelyn. When she went into the field, she was thrice challenged. She was doing American Jewish history. She felt marginalized as a woman scholar, and her first book was about Jews and crime. So this was, so here's what she writes, a short, a short snippet. You're a what? Peevishly asked the receptionist, scanning the detailed biographical form she insists I must attend to before seeing the doctor. You're a what? At first I thought she could not make out my handwriting, and for good reason. Over the years, it has gone steadily downhill, gotten murkier. But no, that wasn't it. Pen penmanship wasn't the problem. The word was H-I-S-T-O-I-I-A-N. Historian was the culprit gumming up the works. The receptionist did not understand what I had written. Historian simply did not register. In her line of work, she hadn't encountered too many of that ilk. I suppose I could have made the receptionist's life and my own life a bit easier by writing professor or author in the little box reserved for occupation. But something, perhaps pride, stayed my hand. It had taken me a very long time to live up to the title of historian, and I was not about to surrender it simply because a receptionist did not know what it meant, let alone what it entailed. Wearing the mantle of historian was precious and hard won, and therein lies the story. 
my story. I would say it's also our story. Yeah. Uh, and it's a wonderful essay, very accessible. And she writes so well. And she became really the most renowned figures in, the, in material culture, both American Jewish history and American history. And I would say, as far as Jenna, Weissman Jocelyn is concerned, she brought her expertise as an American Jewish historian in terms of infiltrating and growing the larger field of American history. So she's, all the essays are worthy of reading, but hers stands out for me as very, very special in terms of her honesty and what she had to overcome. I recall that when we finished our PhDs around the same time, there was a seminar at YIVO, which is the Yiddish Scientific Organization, politically more to the left than anything else. And I got up and I spoke about Harlem, and there were two questions, and I sat down. And Jenna got up and she spoke about Jews and crime, and she was attacked by the audience. What do you mean, like Jean Valjean, is he a, is he a, is he a criminal? <laughs> the real criminals are the capitalists, and you're writing about <laughs> Jews who ended up in crime. So she, starting out, she had a difficult time. And as a woman early in the field, and as American Jewish historian, and I'm proud to say she's a friend, as all these people are, and she overcame some very substantial barriers to make a significant contribution. So I, I want to pick up on the piece of your uh, anecdote about crime, because one of the common themes is, you know, when you write about American Jewish history, you're writing about something that, since all of us are American Jews, we all feel somewhat proprietary about. So they were co concerned that you didn't do right by, you know, by writing about Jewish criminals. And many of us here write about um, feeling uh, criticized because of what we wrote. Jonathan, you wrote, how could you write a whole book about American Judaism and not write about Greensboro when you spoke in Greensboro? <laughs> and I certainly, I, my earliest, um, uh, experience with that was my master's essay on Camp Ramah, which was the first history of the founding of Camp Ramah. And after that, you know, I never heard the end of it from the various founders who were like, well, you know, I thought you really didn't give enough due to my role in the founding of Ramah, and not her role, and let alone when I wrote my book about rabbis' wives and would speak around the country and wherever I went, particularly in synagogues, uh, individuals would come up to me and say, well, I mean, that's nice, but you didn't write about my Rebetzin. So, you know, that, that is uh, but it's part even, of that. It's, it's even yeah, worse than that. Hazard. I always keep it to my medievalist colleagues. Nobody yeah. gets up in the audience and says, right. I heard Maimonides say the following. That's right. And, 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 <laughs> right? I heard Stephen S. Y. say the following, and that's not the way you're interpreting it. So that, that's which, something. Which I have to say is why Shia Cohen mm. tried desperately to convince me to go into ancient Jewish history, that's because right, right, not right. only is there no one who can dispute anything, but he said, look, there's just a finite number of sources that we have. It's so much simpler. You know what you have to deal with, and you can focus on that. You know what Naomi used to say to me? She said, uh, an ancient historian finds a laundry list on a papyrus and they write a book about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Indeed. So she that said. <laughs> but I, haven't, I do have to say, writing on the 19th century, it doesn't talk back to you yes. in, uh, uh, in quite the same way. And one of the challenges of American Jewish history is that everybody uh, feels uh, that they are expert. I, I should remind you, I actually did a book on the Jews of Cincinnati. So uh, you can imagine uh, what that was like here. And, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think the totality of those books about Jewish communities and synagogues and so on has enormously enriched our understanding of the American Jewish experience. And my sense is, um, and we're seeing it more and more with the fellows who come here to the archives, more and more people who work on a European Jewish history, work on totally other areas, are discovering America mm -hmm. and its centrality. For many, many years, 
there was modern Jewish history and American Jewish history, as if America was somehow not part of modern Jewish history. I was, you know, just out there. Uh, and I would like to believe that in uh, the 21st century, uh, uh, that machitza, that uh, <laughs> divider between American Jewish history and the rest of Jewish history uh, will be uh, thrown down, and the interaction of American Jewish history with the rest of Jewish history uh, will be highlighted. And all of these works have really helped to make that happen. And there clearly are themes that arose in American Jewish history that now are being explored elsewhere. And that unification uh, of modern Jewish history, I think, is enormously, uh, enormously important. Well, I, I would just add one, one uh, and I, 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 if this is self-serving, then it's self-serving for the American Jewish Archives. Uh, when I saw the list of all the scholars when the book first came out, I immediately saw that every single one of them <laughs> has studied at the American Jewish Archives, and well, most well, of them... Yeah. It's true. It's and most of them, the vast majority of them, uh, served as fellows. What, what does that exactly mean? It's another one of Dr. Marcus's uh, brainchild. He borrowed from uh, his experiences in Europe. He, he decided that we needed to actually bring people to Cincinnati and allow them to have a month of study so they could pursue the research that they wanted to pursue. He realized that Cincinnati is uh, in the 20th century, not on, if you will, the main highway, and so you had to help people come and stay here to study. So he raised monies, and uh, Professor Sarna was the first, uh, and uh, this coming academic year, uh, we will have 22 wow. fellows during the course of the academic year come, come to, we already have a fellow here? Yes. Introduce oh, nice. yourself. Um, I'm, I'm Joe Block. Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of North Carolina. Um, I'm yep. actually not from North Carolina. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can hear clearly you're from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what are you studying? You, I, I actually I study black Jewish relations in, in the history of ideas. Jews and blacks in the age of Jim Crow. Good luck. <laughs> Come see me in New York. <laughs> so uh, I'm now going to turn to the audience to see if there are questions that you'd like to ask. Uh, yes, Professor, uh, Professor, oh, Dr. Tucker. <laughs> standing on the shoulders of giants, which you all have really uh, explained. Uh, and this, um, this journey or this odyssey that you've experienced is a certain maturation of, that you've come to grips with and uh, uh, of American Jewish history in your professional life. So the, um, is there any truth or contradiction to the, I think it was a philosopher or, or a historian, Santiana, that those who uh, don't read it or, 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 or study history or doom to repeat it. Do you think that um, in your experience of American Jewish, even though it's, it's young here, uh, do you see any truth or contradiction to that statement and what you've experienced with American Jewish history? I mean, so, so, so I, I think, I think the essence of the question was, I think, uh, you stop me if I'm wrong, that uh, although American Jewish history is, uh, you know, in terms of covering Jewish history is a, a short period of time, relatively speaking, um, the question was, do, are there repetitive themes? Do we see history in a way repeating itself in terms of the study as we reconstruct the past, are we seeing repetitions of things that happen? 
I, I, I'm maybe uh, Dr. Sutton wants to talk about. I mean, I've, I, I've heard him lecture on uh, the depression, so maybe he could use that as an example or whatever he wants to use. I mean, a, this is a free country, Jonathan, so you say what you want to say. So. <laughs> they, um, uh, you know, historians actually repeat themselves all the time, but that's a different matter. Um, they, uh, I certainly believe that the American Jewish community suffers from the fact that it more frequently listens to sociologists who take a survey of what's going on now and that we do not frequently enough look at the long span of American Jewish history and see what we can learn from earlier moments. So for example, right now, uh, there is a view uh, held by some uh, that, you know, we're seeing far fewer young Jews interested in synagogue life. 20% um, uh, at least decline. There's a great religious recession, as I call it, in America, and we're seeing it in Jewish life as well. Um, and a very esteemed sociologist, you know, looks at the trajectory and uh, sees it going down, down, down. And I don't have to remind you uh, that this has consequences. Prime Minister of Israel uh, concluded, I really have to listen to uh, many of the Jews in America because another generation or two, they won't be here. Um, that's a linear view. But um, as a historian, I know that we've had these re religious recessions before. Yeah, there are awakenings and there are uh, uh, religious awakenings. And there's what Finney, the great evangelist, called backsliding. That American, the history of American religion is up and down. And in another 10, 20 years, the same newspapers will see surprising evidence of a resurgence of interest in religion among young Jews, uh, unsuspected interest, and so on. Um, that's an example of where a historian brings um, a very substantial uh, breadth and can see recurring patterns, and I think is unlikely to fall into the trap of taking what's going on now and assuming that that will continue indefinitely into the future. Uh, as I recently said in a different context, I cannot offhand think of a single moment in American Jewish history where if you had predicted what things would be like in 50 years, you would have correct. been correct. Think of what we thought would be in 1930 and what turned out in 1980. And even in nine, you know, 50 years ago uh, now, uh, in 1968, I don't think anybody imagined uh, many of the themes of American Jewish life today. So a historian with a, what the French call long durée, a sense of uh, a, a broad view of the history, I think can considerably help us understand the present in context and maybe even uh, offer uh, reassurance in some respects about the future. I'd like to take the question in a different direction, and that is right now, this year, we're dealing with the the rise of significance in some areas of the alt-right and anti-Semitism, uh, and people who, who, who are afraid of this phenomenon have no understanding of what the situation was like in the 1920s and 1930s and think that uh, this is... Henry Ford! Henry Ford. <laughs> <laughs> German-American Bund, yeah, Ku Klux Klan, yeah. and the like. Uh, I imagine had you lived in South Carolina, you have done your essay on the Klan, but you happen to be in Boston, so that was part of that dynamic. By the way, the American Hebrew in 1920 asked Cyrus Adler 
and Stephen Wise, and I think it was Julian Morgenstern, to write pieces about what American Jewish life would be like in the year 2000. And uh, they, it, it didn't work out that way. Let's put it that way in yeah, terms yeah, of every. The, right. And so so the, the only thing that I would add is that I think part of your question comes from a place of concern for the future. And I, I can speak for myself, but I think I speak for all of us, that we, we are deeply passionate as historians, and so I couldn't agree more with what, the way you answered, Jonathan. But we care that Jews know their past because you can't really figure out how to move forward if you don't know where you come from. And so there's a, I think, Gary, you actually had something like that in your essay that there, you wrote there, that um, what you learned from Rabbi Marcus was that you wrote there was a higher purpose and transcendent meaning to the work of the American Jewish historian. And I share, I share that view, right? We, we are of the, we are what we study. And uh, certainly for me, as someone teaching and working with students at the Jewish Theological Seminary, the future matters to us. And to the extent that we can, through our scholarship, have, help shape the understanding of the American Jewish experience for those that will take it forward to the next generation, I can't think of something um, a greater privilege than to be able to do that. Any other questions? Okay, I see. Good. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to have to be disciplined so we can get through them. Uh, Lev. Um, a question for all of you. Have you ever had a moment where you were doing research and either you literally stumbled across or you might have purposely been looking for it but only as like a side minor thing, you weren't taking much, didn't, didn't take it seriously, and you found yourself falling down the rabbit hole, you just found you discovered something really amazing, like why did I ever even think that this would be something of importance before, and then you find yourself falling into this amazing research. Every day. Every, yeah. Yeah. Always. 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 I mean, if if I could do questions. research every day, <laughs> I would, I, I yeah. think that's the excitement of, of research, when you uncover a document and you are astonished and a lot of things um, come together. Um, and uh, often um, uh, one will be surprised. Even, even in this book, I read Shuley's essay and she talks there about, as she told you, Aaron Schumann's fall. And of all places, He's in New Orleans. And suddenly I say, wow, we think of New Orleans, and most of us do not imagine Hebraism. But there's Dinard is living in New Orleans at that time. Spall is living in New Orleans. Raisin is living uh, in New yep. Orleans. Something's going on in, in uh, New Orleans uh, at that moment, and it would be a good subject for somebody to look at. Um, uh, and, and that's the more you read, the more times those serendipitous discoveries come to you and they may turn out to be more important than what you w were um, uh, studying in the first place. I'll say something else. Um, I keep good records of what I've done because I want to be famous someday. <laughs> Um, and I, I wish I had my, syllab my syllabi, my basic course, over the last 40 years because so few of the books that were used 40 years ago we're still using today, <laughs> although some have survived, like Moses Rishon, The Promised mm -hmm. City. Everyone still uses that book. Mm -hmm. And I realize that uh, things that I wrote and others wrote are being revised and reinterpreted and finding different nuances over the course of time. And that is one of the things that makes American Jewish history exciting because we're a dynamic field and that uh, there are always people doing new types of things based upon what they saw initially. So that, that make, that's the spice of life as far as 
I'm concerned. So maybe what we'll do is I'm going to let I'm going to ask a few get a few of the questions out. We'll just go ask yeah. the questions yeah. and we'll try to go at them. So put your hand up if you wanted to ask a question. Okay, so keep your hand up. Your your question, please. Okay, you got that? Okay, good question. Okay, Professor Grayson. Um, so you all talked a lot about um, how you have American Jewish history vis a vis the field of Jewish history, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about your experiences in terms of validating the field in the eyes of your colleagues in the field of American history and some experiences you have with that. Okay, you have that? Professor Common? We have that? Okay. Uh, please. Um, I was just wondering if there was a particular area of history that you're um, interested in doing research on or in presently writing a book or you know, some, sort of, some sort of research that you're working on right now. Thank you, Meryl. John? Any other questions? Bruce? Anything unique to right now that you can, from the pessimism aside, uh, successfully work down the road will look back at this time that is somewhat unique and interesting? Did you hear that question? Say the question again, Dr. Sarnadi. Yeah. When historians down the road look back to current, what now is current times, will then be Jewish history. Do you think there's anything going on right now that you think is particularly interesting that will be right for a ah. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Why don't we not all deal with all of them? We'll just take some of them, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay? Because there are many important things that Dr. Marcus said that bear repeating. For example, in answering your question, Lev, it's true everything that they said, but Dr. Marcus would always caution scholars when you were working on a particular project, he would say, stay on the main river, don't wander up the tributaries. <laughs> because, it, and especially today with the internet and research online, you can end up going off into the sunset and never getting back to what you're trying to finish. And another important lesson that he gave was, the mind can absorb only as much as the tushy can endure. So we will wrap, we will wrap up pretty soon. So uh, why don't you, why don't you uh, uh, take whatever questions you want to take? Surely wanted you to go first. Um, well, I'm going to focus on this uh, uh, American Jewish history or American historians who study Jews, I guess. And I think that what you will see from the volume is you have scholars who have, you know, as Jeff said before, many different entry points. Some were doing American studies and found their way to study Jews. Um, uh, Hasia Diner has a great piece in here where she was taking a course in ethnic history 
and the one casual remark from the professor saying, oh, and by the way, if any of you um, know an immigrant language, you might want to use that in your research. And because she grew up in a Yiddish-speaking home, there you go. She did make use of that in that paper, and that led her in a certain direction in terms of her field. Um, and that, you know, now others came in through women's history. Joyce Antler, for example, started in women's history and then came in through to American Jewish history. Ravel and Prell came in through anthropology. Uh, but some of us, and I think certainly Jeff and myself, were I, I when I chose to do American Jewish history, that was more the experience that I had. American historians who worked on Jews, and I really understood American Jewish history within the trajectory of Jewish history, and that was the primary frame in which I chose to study, which is why I chose to study, do my doctorate at JTS, and also focus, I think, as you did, Jonathan, on American religious history. I also focus a little bit on the history of uh, American education, and, you know, so... Let, let me try variety. this out, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If we go back 50, 60 years, the history of America was the history of elites, elites, white, male, Protestants, etc. I think the rise of American Jewish history had a lot to do with greater acceptance in a multicultural environment of the fact that the Jewish story could be part of a larger immigrant tale. The truth is it goes back to Marcus Lee Hansen in the 1930s, but the efflorescence later on. Contemporaneously, some of the work done in American, in American history sometimes sees Jews as an elite group that did so well in America, and the narrative that's emerging is of, of, the, of people from the bottom up, people who have not done well, and there's been a neglect of the Jewish story that although, fortunately, we've done very well in the, this country, our story is a story of immigrants coming to America and making their mark in this country. So we have to be, this does not come into play at yeshiva or at the seminary, right. but I'm sure my colleagues in, in other universities feel that sort of tension. How relevant is the American Jewish story? So we went from being outsiders when it was an elite history to somewhat, my fear is, possibly become marginalized because we're too uh, invisible, uh, to not so much marginalized, yeah. but invisible as white Americans. Right. right. And that's what you're right. seeing in the academy mm -hmm. now. I'll comment directly on, on Professor Grayson's uh, interesting question. First of all, I think American Jewish history is actually harder because you really have to know three histories. Right. You have to know American Jewish history, obviously, but unless you know American history and Jewish history, you can't really fit the pieces together. And the pieces that I'm most proud of in my own work are where, in fact, I've been able uh, to bring those together. Um, I certainly think in the world of American religion, I'm actually an officer of the American Academy of Religion. And I think in that world, it is evident that Judaism is part of uh, American religion. But I was very happy to see that the American Historical Review had an article, an important article, of American Jewish his, uh, historical interest dealing with the history of American Jewish philanthropy that was attempting to shed light on currents in American philanthropy, generally using the American Jewish story to make a larger point. That is when we do um, our, uh, our best work. Um, uh, I completely agree that there has never been a more important time to teach history because part of the teaching of history is figuring out what really happened and what is a fact and how do I prove something and what is a primary source and how do I find it. Um, and in our day, um, uh, that is essential. And um, uh, you know, I, I, I think 
uh, that uh, those of us who teach students uh, have a special responsibility today to highlight at that point. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, it would take us too far afield, but I'm always doing uh, new things. Um, that's why I went into this field, and uh, I'm always you know, excited about uh, new projects, and I think that knowing my colleagues and, and knowing the people uh, up here, um, uh, I, I think that's true of all of us, and I would say that only a very small percentage of all the projects that could be done here at the American Jewish Archives have been done. There's plenty of room for new fellows, and uh, it's, it's not like everything that needs to be known has already uh, been discovered, and indeed, and I say this in the essay, one of the reasons I went into American Jewish history is it's, it's full of terra incognita, of unknown uh, uh, pieces, unknown uh, chapters that are just waiting for uh, smart young people to uh, write. I'm thrilled at this fellowship program, and especially when one sees somebody moving into an area uh, that uh, has not been written about. And yeah, I think future historians will be very excited uh, about our time. We have to live it, but they'll be excited about it mm -hmm. because uh, all sorts of interesting, unpredicted um, developments have taken place. If you had asked anybody 20, not 50, 20 years ago whether there would be a presidential election where both the Democrat and the Republican had a Jewish son-in-law, an election that was, as one pundit said, the battle of the Mahatonim. <laughs> Nobody, nobody would have imagined that that would have been the case. And yet, that's what happened in 2016. And it's, it's funny, but it reflects vast changes in American Jewish marital patterns, uh, it reflects the fact that Jews have married in to very significant families on both sides of the aisle. You couldn't write uh, a, a lot about changes in American Jewish life uh, based just on our time. So if you think history ended, uh, it never ends. And thank God, I know because I send stuff, and I hope you do too, History is ongoing. I send lots of stuff of our time to the American Jewish Archives because I know in 50 years from now, someone will be very happy that that document has been preserved. Yes, that, that's where I wanted to com comment on your, your question, Bruce, that one of the exciting parts of my work, one of many, is gathering material that relate to future historians, material that I know can't be used today, but will be of value in the future. But to answer your question directly, and this is just one, two, two ideas of, of many, but I, I personally think that uh, the relationship between, changing relationship between uh, the state of Israel, the Jewish community uh, of the United States of America, North America, and Israel, that that's going to be a topic uh, that will be very interesting 20, 25 years. This is going to be an important period similar to the 60s. Uh, that's one. And the other, of course, and this is a no-brainer, uh, that is the impact of the social media on American Jewish life, meaning all the new technologies, uh, you know, uh, what, what that's going to influence. John, somehow I feel we didn't answer your question, did we? I think Professor Gerard basically. Okay, great. Great. And, uh, of course, Mr. Krauss, uh, your question, which Dr. Sarna answered, but really, in my opinion, it touches upon every one of us in every field, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Gary, you, you asked me to reference some of the people who aren't here who can. That's right. That, this is so, what we're going to do. So You're going to do that. So I've already read Jenna's. Right. And then we're going to conclude. Okay. I want to read one last excerpt, okay? 
The first words he spoke that day seemed to confirm my worst fears. Quote, it is a long-standing rule at the Hebrew Union College for instructors to call the roll on the first day of class, he began, and I shall not breach that tradition. Not since grammar school had one of my teachers called the roll. Was Marcus really going to call roll for graduate rabbinical students? Then unexpectedly, Marcus proceeded to dazzle and delight us. After calling each of our family names one by one from A to Z, he spontaneously anatomized every name for the class's edification, followed by a breathtakingly learned and panoramic historical excursion into some historical subject matter relating to the student's name. Of course, Zola was the last name, I imagine. <laughs> Marcus's opening performance was a tour de force, an impressive display of his remarkable mental agility. He was 83 years old at that point. His comprehensive grasp of Jewish history, his computer-like ability to retrieve and present data in an instant, and of course, his wonderfully winning personality. My colleagues and I instantly realized we were in the presence of a scholar who had mastered not only his field, but every period in Jewish history. Thank you, Gary, for running these words. So uh, I want to say uh, uh, some thank yous. Uh, I said to the scholars earlier, and I want to repeat that uh, it always looks so easy for someone like myself to come to the podium and uh, it appears as if I am personally responsible for everything that took place this evening and the wonderful uh, program we had. And in fact, uh, I'm one of the least responsible because it's the wonderful staff and administration of the American Jewish Archives. So I'd like to ask you to help me to thank them. And here's who I'd like you to thank. First of all, Lisa Frankel, Director of Administration. <laughs> Lisa and I have been working together for almost 34 years, and her wheelchair is right out there. You know, so, uh, and of course, I want to thank uh, the irrepressible superintendent of this building who makes sure the building looks as beautiful as it does, Mr. Al Samandel. How many people were watching this all over the world, Al? Do we know, Ron? Didn't? All right, we'll have to check. Well, we, 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 this is the first time from the American Jewish Archives we've been uh, streaming this live outside of Cincinnati. So I want to welcome a special guest who's come here, and I want you to give a loud cheer for uh, a former camper of mine. Back there in the last row is uh, Mr. Howard Mortman. Mr. Mortman, wait, wait, wait. Mr. Mortman is uh, the head of promotion and publicity for C-SPAN. And uh, you may know C-SPAN once was here and did a, a program from the American Jewish Archives, and I want you to welcome him so warmly that he and his colleagues will come back. So. <laughs> Mrs. Heldman, put your hand up if you would. You, you're looking, it you just shows you the history is with us, Mrs. Heldman was Dr. Marcus's secretary. And we are very happy to have you here and connect all the dots for us by your presence. Thank you. So uh, we have, of course, a gracious reception for everybody waiting for you outside. These books will be on sale. All of the scholars will uh, be available to put his or her John or Jane Hancock onto the book. And uh, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, Lisa is going to give you, if you're interested, one week from today, because this is American Jewish History Month and uh, we are doing everything we can to live up to it here in Cincinnati, uh, we are having a, a terrific program that Professor Mark Rader from the University of Cincinnati right over here has organized. It's a conference on the Balfour Declaration. And Lisa's going to uh, hand out the schedule, but I'll just mention, and all are welcome. It's open to all. It's not uh, closed to the general public. 
but there is a, um, a major address that's going to be given here at 5 o'clock one week from today by uh, the former president of Brandeis University, and that is uh, Professor Yehuda Reinhardt, who is currently finishing a multi-volume work on Chaim Weizmann, and his keynote address will be on that. You are all welcome. If you had a good time tonight, yeah. make it next week. So uh, uh, won't you uh, uh, help me to conclude the evening by once again thanking Professor Sana, Professor Shuli Ruben Schwartz, Professor Gura. Thank you. Well done.